today's lecture is going to be on handling uh, databases that exceed the size of memory, which is sort of going against everything we've talked about this semester. Um, but we'll see how to, you know, techniques to, to, to bring back the disk without hopefully slowing us down entirely and, re and sort of regressing to a disk-oriented database system. So real quick, the, I want to go over the schedule, what's coming up for you guys, the rest of this, uh, the next steps of the semester. You just make a noise. <laughs> <laughs> It's going to show up on the audio, too. All right. Um, all right. So the first project is due next week uh, on, on Wednesday. The same day in class, I will announce what the, uh, the second project is. Central, central, second project is a three-person project where you, you, uh, you pursue some aspect of the system for the, now into the rest of the semester. So I'll describe what's entailed for the second project, what, what you have to do to each step. Um, but what I'll also do now, I'll do it today or tomorrow, I'll send an email on Piazza to post a link to a Google spreadsheet, because some of you have already sort of filled out, figured out what groups you're in, so you just list the three members of your group, right? You don't have to pick a project at this point, but you at least want to tell me what group you're going to be in, and that way if there's any like free, free agents, we can make sure you get uh, put into a group. Um, we also announced uh, the extra credit. Uh, next next week as well. If you took the intro class, it's the same thing. Pick your favorite obscure database system and write a Wikipedia style uh, article uh, for it. Um, and I'll give the I'll give the list of what systems are still available. I think we're up to like 581 now. Uh, I found an, a, another one last week. Or Uber announced they have a graph uh, a GPU database called Agents DB or something like that. Anyway, there's a, there's a bunch of different systems you can choose from. Uh, March 6th will be the midterm exam, and that'll be in class. And this will be like sort of a combination of long form question and multiple choice. And then after spring break, we'll do the project proposals in class. And that's basically you'll get up here with your group, spend five minutes and say, I'm going to do X. You guys are going to build X. But it's a little bit more deeper than like, I, we hope to do this. You actually want to spend time looking at the code and trying to figure out how it is that you're actually going to do it. And you can meet with me if you want to, because I'll be around during spring break. All right, so any questions about any of these things? OK. And then just a reminder again, on, on tomorrow, uh, the Splice Machine guy is coming to give a talk, and that'll be 12 o'clock uh, over in the CIC with lunch served. It'll be pizza, OK? All right. So before we jump into what today's lecture is about, I want to spend time to teach what bloom filters are, because I think some of you didn't know, what, didn't know what it was last class, and we need it for today. We're actually going to need it for a lot of different other parts of the system uh, going forward. So bloom filters are a probabilistic data structure that are designed to answer set membership queries. So set membership queries would be, is, is, my key, is this key in my set? Right? That's pretty much all you can, you can do with it. Um, so it's, it's a probabilistic data structure because it is not going to be deterministic, or it's not going to be exact. Right? So we'll never have false negatives. If we ask it, does something exist in our set, it'll never tell us no when it actually really does. But we may get false positives. We may ask it, does my key exist in my set? And it tells me yes, tells me true, but it actually doesn't. Right? And there's, uh, Bloom filters are old, they're like from the 1970s. The guy that invented it is actually named Bloom, B L O O M, <coughs> right? So that's why they're called that. So the Bloom filter is essentially just a bitmap. That's all it is. But instead of using it to set single bits in the same way we saw with maybe so the tri data structures, anytime you want to uh, look up or manipulate it, we, we're going to use a series of hash functions to figure out what bits we should be looking at. So if I want to do an insert, if I want to insert this, this key k, then I'll have k hash functions that I'm going to hash x for each of them multiple times. And I just mod the, the, the hash value I get for each function by the number of bits that I have. And that tell me, tells me what bits I need to set in my bitmap. So now if I need to do a lookup, uh, I do the same thing. I just take the key hash it the same way I did as an insert, and just check to see whether every bit for all my hash functions is set to true. And if yes, then I know it's in there. If at least one bit is set to zero, then I know it's not in my set. So let's look at a really simple example. So you have an eight-bit uh, Bloom filter. And so initially, all the bits are set to zero. So let's say the first thing we want to do is insert the key RZA. So we'll have two hash functions, k equals two. So for the first hash function, we, we, we just, this doesn't need to be like murmur hash, doesn't need to be like city hash. This can be like simple bit shifting arithmetic to compute the hash really fast. It right? doesn't need to be super you know, cryptographically safe. So let's say our hash value is 222. We mod by the number of bits, uh, which is 8. 
and then we get six. So we go update the six bit here. Same for this guy, second hash function, we, after modding eight, we get four, we set that bit. And now our key is in, is in our blue filter, it's in our set. Let's insert Jizza. same thing. First hash function gives us three, second hash function gives us one, okay? So now let's do a lookup. Say we look up Raekwon, uh, and so for this, the first hash function gives us five, which is not set. Second hash function gives us three, which is set, but because at least one bit is set to zero, then we know Raekwon is not in our set. So again, a balloon filter will never give you false positives. It'll never tell you something doesn't exist when it really does exist. But, all right, so this returns false. So let's try to do a lookup on ODB. So in this one here, we, the first bit we get to, to uh, three, that's set. The second bit gets set to six, that is set. So this would come back as true. But we know this, you know, this actually is not in our set because we didn't insert it. So this is an example of a false positive. It could tell us something exists when it doesn't exist. Right? So this is a really simple idea, but it's a really powerful primitive that we can use in a bunch of different places in our database system. So we'll see this today in the case of Project Siberia for Hecaton. They're going to use a balloon filter to figure out whether a key actually exists on disk or not. Right? And yet you'll not have false negatives, so it'll never tell you something doesn't exist when it actually doesn't exist on disk. When it, does ex when it actually does exist, but you may get false positives, the balloon filter may tell you this key exists, you go out the disk, and then you find out it's actually not there. So there's this great trade-off of, 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 in exchange for having these false positive rates, you can significantly reduce the amount of I.O. or amount of operations you need to do. So we'll see balloon filters in a bunch of other uh, areas in the system. Like we'll, we'll use them for, for joins. We'll do a balloon filter before we do a probe in the, in the hash table. And because, again, this, this hash function doesn't need to be super sophisticated, this can be a few number of instructions to go check a balloon filter to see whether something exists in our hash table, and that avoids the expense of computation of looking up in the hash table. So is this clear what a balloon filter is? Right, so the only thing you can do is insert and look up. You can't delete because how are you going to know which, which bit, you know, was this bit set by just you or a bunch of other people? Right? And you also can't do range queries on this because, again, you don't have any of the keys, any information in your bitmap. You just know what a bunch of bits are set. You don't know what the original keys were. But just that simple primitive of does, does this thing exist, yes or no, can allow us to do more sophisticated things. Okay. So, with that said, let's talk about larger than memory databases. So, it should be sort of obvious about why we want to do this, right? DRAM is expensive. It's really expensive compared to what your alternatives are, like a spinning disk hard drive or even a NAND flash SSD. So, uh, for DRAM, roughly the price in 2017, 2018, it's roughly about $15 per gigabyte. Uh, a f NAND flash would be roughly 30 cents to a dollar per gigabyte. Like the enterprise ones are like the dollar range, the cheap consumer ones are, are, are less. But like a spinning disk hard drive, right? The, the old school rotating disk drives, those things are like three cents per gigabyte, right? So it'd be nice if we can put our, some of our database out, out in disk uh, because storing everything in memory is being super expensive because it's, you know, buying DRAM is expensive. But also, not only is buying DRAM expensive, it's actually maintaining in, in, our, in our system is also expensive, right? Because the, the DRAM can't persist storage if, if you lose power. So the motherboard basically sends a little charge to every DRAM slot or DRAM DIM every so, so many seconds to refresh the charge so that it retains its values. So there was a study done, I mean, it's about 10, 15 years ago, but they, they, they calculated that about 40% of the energy cost of a single box it's just spent on refreshing DRAM, right? So again, this is gonna be really expensive. Um, you may say, all right, well, can't I go distributed? Wouldn't that solve my problem? Like if I hit hitting the limit of how much memory I can have in a single box. Being distributed causes a bunch of other problems, right? Because you need to be consistent across those different machines. But you're still storing everything in DRAM. So, so, so these things still, you know, these issues still hold. So, so that's our goal for today. The goal of today is figure out how can we incorporate cheaper storage in our database while still having all the benefits of being an in-memory database system and the performance benefits you get over a disk-oriented system. So today's agenda, we'll start off talking about the background of, of what we're going to focus on or what kind of workloads we, we want to target for these, this technique. Then we'll talk about the implementation issues you have to be mindful of in order to bring back disk in an in-memory in in database. 
And then we'll go through a bunch of examples of how, we, how systems actually implement this, including the, the Lean Store paper that you guys read. Um, and actually, this shouldn't be here. There's no evaluation. I, I pulled it out because we're, we're going to run out of time. I'm going to try to pack less, less slides into my lecture so we're not like r rushing through it. Okay? All right. So, again, the basic goal of what we're trying to achieve today is that we want to allow uh, our in-memory database to be able to store and access data that's not in memory, but that's actually on some auxiliary storage, whether it's NAND flash or an SSD, it doesn't matter. And we want to be able to do this without having to bring back all the stuff we said we wanted to get rid of at, at the beginning of the semester from a disk-oriented database system. So we don't want to bring back the page table. We don't want to bring back a lock table. We want to bring, all that stuff is, is we, we showed was be super slow for an in-memory database. So we don't want to bring all that stuff back in. All right, so that's, that's, the, that's the goal we're trying to turn to do. Now, in order to do this, we need to now be aware of what are the access method differences between the, the, the DRAM and, and, and disk. Again, we already covered this at the beginning of the semester, but we should start thinking about this now uh, in, in context of, of trying to solve this problem. So the main thing is that in the in-memory storage, what we've been focusing on so far is that everything's been tuple-oriented. All the different components we've talked about building, whether it's the indexes, the concurrent control scheme, uh, the, the storage manager, all that has been focused on just having byte addressable uh, pointers to tuples, right? I, my index points to a tuple. My storage manager points to tuples, right? We're not going to be able to do that in a disk uh, with disk storage because these things are block-oriented storage. I Meaning, if I want a single tuple, I can't just go get that one tuple by itself. I got to go fetch the page, which is four kilobytes of of that that the tuple resides in, then bring that in memory and do something with it and try to pick out the, the thing that I want, right? So we're not going to worry about how do we incorporate uh, disk in our join algorithms and other aspects of, of, of the query execution. It's really focusing on at the sort of storage layer, how do we bring this in without, uh, you know, and, and without having to change all the rest of the system to be mindful of, hey, we have these pages, and we might be, might be make, they might be dirty, and we have to keep CLRs in our log records. All that we, we, we want to avoid. The other thing I'll say too, this, this we're going to focus on today of just only OLTP query, queries or OLTP workloads, right? And the reason because with, to the best of my knowledge, in OLAP workloads, there's not that much you can do to make uh, the system run faster when you have to read read and write data from disk, right? So if I need to read this entire column, really the only thing, the only sort of optimization I can do is the zone map stuff we talked about last time. Right? This is, allows me to do data skipping to avoid having to read a bunch of your stuff. But at the end of the day, these OLAP queries are going to be doing long sequential scans on tables. And there's no magic we can build in our system to make that go fast. We're always going to be I.O. bound, right? trying to fetch the piece of data that we need and bring it into memory. So all the sort of standard tricks you would do in a regular disk-oriented database that are designed for OLAP workloads, those still apply here. Right? But there's nothing magical we're doing because we're in memory. So instead, we're going to focus on OLTP. And we already talked about what we can exploit about OLTP workloads a little bit when we talked about storage models. Remember I said in these HTAP systems, uh, there's this notion of hot data and cold data. right? Your hot data is what is also called your working set. It's the data in your database, the subset of, of the entire data that most of your transactions are reading and writing from. Right? Just think of, any, think of your favorite website, like Reddit or whatever. Like, no one's going back and commenting on Reddit posts from six months ago. Or you're, posting, you're posting comments on what's hot today, right? That's the hot data. We want to keep that in memory. And maybe stuff from six months ago we can shove out the disk, right? So what we're going to need to be able to do is we need a way to move the cold data, once we identify it, and we'll talk about how to do that in a second, we'll move the cold data out the disk and then have it appear to the rest of the system that the, that the data is actually in memory. Right? Your, your join algorithms, all the query execution stuff ab above us in the storage layer, they all think this is in memory. They can still access it, and they, they still know about it. But at some point when they try to go touch the data that's out on disk, we have a way to go and pull that data from the disk and bring it back into memory. So the, another way to think about this is that we want to be able to push cold data out of memory into disk. Rather, in a disk-oriented database, you pull hot, you know, hot data from disk into memory. Sort of a semantic difference, but we'll see how the architecture will, will be uh, can change. So let's look at a really simple example here. 
So let's say that we have our database, we have this, this uh, you know, we have, we have a single table, and these are the tuples that are in memory, and then out on disk we have our cold data storage. This is some block-oriented device. Well, let's go through this example here and talk about what are the bunch of questions we have to answer in order to actually make this work in our system. So let's say we have some way to identify that these three tuples are, are cold. I didn't say how we're going to do it, we'll worry about that later, but we, we said these three guys are cold. So what we're going to do is we're, we're going to combine them together into a single page and write that out to our block-based cold, cold data storage. Right, so this would be like a four kilobyte page or some, something, some, uh, you know, some multiple four kilobytes. So now the next question is we have to deal with is, right, that, sorry, that's called a Victor block. So the next question is what do we do with these old slots in our in our in memory table heap where these guys used to be occupied, right? Because the issue is the index, the index is still pointed to these guys, right? It's just a block ID and offset for or some memory location here. So these guys are, this is still going to point to this. So we have to do something about that. Then the next thing is that, say a query comes along and tries to access this thing, right? So the next question is, what do we do with this query? Right? Assuming somehow it, it, figured, it can figure out where, you know, that it wants this tuple, right? whether it's an index or a sequential scan, it doesn't matter. But we can't actually run this query because the tuple it needs is out on disk. So what do we do with this? Do we abort it and then fetch the in the background what it needs and try to restart it? Do we stall it? Like as you would in a disk oriented database and sort of keep that idle while we try to do other stuff and then go fetch the data that it needs? Right? So that's unclear what we should do. Then once we go fetch this data in, right, again, I'm I'm the cold di disk storage is a block oriented device. So I can't just go get tuple one. I gotta go get the entire page or the entire block that tuple one is located in. But now what do I do with that block? Do I just merge the one tuple back into memory and leave that, leave that there? Or do I have to merge everything else? And do I actually want to put it back into the, the, the full table heap and the update on my indexes? Or do, should I just uh, put it into a temporary buffer, run that query, then throw it away? Right, so these are the questions we're going to, an we're gonna, we're gonna answer today about how we actually want to architect all this, all this, all, you know, all the entire system. So, not to go into another diatribe again, but, uh, I said in the beginning, you never use MMAP, and I, uh, it's almost like a, a, a fanatical belief of mine. Although, we actually are starting this semester to, the progress to actually prove scientifically that this is, that my, you know, not, not lifelong ambition, but my, what's the word I'm looking for? Irrational uh, 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 obsession with MMAP is a bad idea. Uh, we're actually trying to prove that this semester, so it's a work in progress. But, in, in just to understand why MMAP is still a bad idea for this, uh, the main issue is going to be is that since we want to do transactions and transactions could start updating data, we don't want to use MMAP because we're not going to have control over uh, when pages get written to disk and when the log records that correspond to uh, the changes that modify that page get written out to disk. So because of this reason, uh, again, we covered this last, last semester and we'll cover this again on, on next week when we talk about uh, logging, we don't want the OS to do any of this. Now, there'll be one example I'll show from, from researchers, researchers at EPFL where they actually do, do use MMAP, but they use it in a clever way where they sort of quarantine the, the data that, that the, the MMAP's allowed to flush out and prevent the OS from modifying this other region of data. So then you don't have this problem. There's other issues that uh, there's no easy mechanism for asynchronous read ahead uh, or writing out multiple pages concurrently. Some, there are flags with mAdvise you can try to use or, or, and, and implement prefetching separately in other threads. Uh, I don't want to get into details of why, why this doesn't always work, but it, it, suffice to say, it doesn't always do what you think it's going to do. And it's very hard to, 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 to enforce these things. Like mAdvise doesn't always do what, what you want it to do. So again, never use mAp for your database, although we'll, we'll look at some examples where it might be okay. All right, so what are the, what are the design issues we want to talk about? So there's basically three categories of things we need to implement or, or think about when we want to add disk uh, back to our system. So the first are runtime operations. What should the data database be doing as it's executing transactions and queries to keep track of what data is, is hot versus cold? Then when it comes time to say we're running out of space, uh, let's evict some data and put it out to disk. When should we actually do this? And then what metadata should we keep around in memory 
to record that we've put some data out in disk so we don't lose anything and we don't have any false negatives. Then when a query tries to touch data we know it's been evicted, we've got to bring it back in. Now the question is how much data should we, should we bring in? What should we do with the query that requested that cold data? Um, and where should we put it? Should we merge into the full table heap or should, should we put it into a temporary buffer? So this, this sort of outline here comes from a paper that we wrote uh, in 2016 in the context of HStore, which is an in-memory database that I helped build, which is the, the, the academic predecessor of BoltDB. Um, so in this paper here, we sort of lay out a bunch of these different policies, but we're also we're looking at sort of more modern storage devices or different classes of storage devices to see how these things change um, in, you know, depending on how fast your disk is. And there was, I don't remember, there, was, there, was, there wasn't really any major finding or difference between like SSDs versus uh, spinning disk hard drives. Like whatever turns out to be this policy is the right way to go. But I forget exactly what it was. For NVM, for non volatile memory, it's slightly different. You want to treat that as just DRAM and work as fast as possible. All right, let's go through each of these one by one. So again, the first thing we have to do is how are we going to, how are we going to identify what data is cold? So one thing I'll say also too for this, the paper you guys read on Lean Store was doing page identification. I'm going to show you a bunch of techniques how to do tuple identification. I consider, I consider the Lean Store paper, which came out last year, the state of the art, whereas the paper I showed you that we wrote was from 2016. And, the, and Lean Store is the only one that I, I'm aware of that does it on a page by page basis. Everybody else has done it on, on, on a tuple by tuple basis. So we'll, to understand why Lean Store I think is a good idea, let's see how we do it with tuples first, see what's, see what's bad about it, and then we'll see how to do it better with Lean Store. All right, so we need to identify that what, what tuples are, are cold. So the two approaches to do this are either online or offline. So online would be the system as it runs queries and runs transactions, it tracks every single tuple you access or even samples what tuples you access. And then records and maintains some metadata in the tuple header itself to say when the last time this thing was accessed. So one approach could be sort of approximating LRU. The LRU chain is keeping pointers of, of, of the linked list. You could also do the clock approach, or I think it called the in, the, in the Lean Store paper, they call it second chance. Same thing, you sort of have set a bit, uh, and then when you touch it, and then you wipe it out when you ever do a pass, and if you wipe it out again, and that bit's set to zero, then you know when to evict it. Right? These are sort of standard bufferable policies, but the same idea is, is can be implemented here, but we're gonna maintain the metadata about what, how tuples are accessed in, inside the tuples themselves. The other approach is to do this offline, and this is where the system as it runs queries, rather than updating the metadata about the access patterns of, of transactions as you're, as you're running them, you just write out a log record that says this, this transaction touched this tuple or accessed this tuple. And then you have a separate background thread that comes along, consumes the log, and then computes some kind of access, access frequencies to figure out which one's the coldest, which one's the hottest. Right? The idea here is you don't put the uh, you don't want the, the, the overhead of maintaining the, the, the metadata about the access patterns in the critical path of execution of queries and transactions. All right, so now we want to evict. So now we recognize that we're running, you know, we're running out of space, or, or actually the question is, how are you going to recognize that we're running out of space? And the two basic approaches to do this are just have a simple threshold that's set by the DBA or the administrator that just tracks how much memory you're using in your, in your tables and in and, and your system, and then when you go above some threshold, like I'm getting near 80% my 80 capacity of what the max amount of memory I, that I have, then that triggers the process of start evicting data. Right, so this is something that the data system implements itself, the system implements itself. The other approach, if we're using MMAP, again, we'll, we'll show an example of this, is that we just punt this decision to the OS, and let, because it's already going to track uh, how pages are accessed in virtual memory. So we'll just let it figure it out when it comes time to evict things, because it knows what's the memory pressure of the overall system. Right? So that, again, this will be done in the background. Uh, but you know, there's other issues because of page faults and you block your threads. We'll, we'll get to that later. All right, so now the question is, if, after we decide what tuples we want to evict, and then we evicted them, we put them out to, out to disk. The next question is, what metadata do we need to main, keep, keep around in memory to record that a tuple used to exist, uh, but now here's where it actually, if you need it, here's where I actually go find it on disk. 
So the first approach is you use, you use tombstone tuples. And this is similar to when we were doing deletes in MVCC at the version chain. We could have a special tombstone tuple to say, you know, here's the end of the version chain, or this tuple doesn't exist anymore. So what happens is that every time you evict a tuple, uh, you then insert a new tombstone tuple that's going to record the, the, the block ID and offset of where the, the, the tuple now exists out on disk. And then you go ahead and update all your indexes to now point to this tombstone tuple. And tombstone tuple obviously is going to, or should be smaller than the original size of the table. Um, ideally, it would be awful if, if like your table has one column that's like a 16-bit integer, and then you, you evict it, and your tombstone tuple is now two 32-bit integers. Right? You, you get no benefit there. But it's, ignore that case. But all their indexes now point to this smaller tombstone tuple that's going to be stored separately from the main table heap. And then that way, if I'm doing a lookup, I follow them at the index, and I land in one of those tombstone tuples. I recognize, oh, the thing, this is not real tuple. I need to go out to disk and get, get, get the data that I'm missing. The next approach is to maintain the, the Bloom filter in memory for every single index that's on your table, and just record that the, for a given key, there, there was a tuple that exists out on disk. The Bloom filter is not going to tell you where it is on disk. There's, there's an on disk index you have to fetch in to figure out where that is. But at least the Bloom filter is going to avoid, it helps you avoid having to do a lookup on that on disk index uh, unnecessarily. Because if it doesn't exist in the Bloom filter, it won't exist on disk. The last approach, again, if you're using MMAP, is to reside on virtual memory. Again, the OS already records or tracks how, uh, uh, you know, what pages have, have been swapped out the disk. And then it knows that any time you do a lookup on one of those pages that's been swapped out, you get a page fault, and it goes out in the disk and fetches it for you. So from our point of view, from the database system, we don't have to do anything extra. There's no extra metadata we need to maintain when something gets evicted, because the OS does that all, you know, for us. And you, now you can, this is another good example of why you know, MMAP and the OS is a sort of a seductress for people that want to implement databases. Because it's like, oh, it's already doing this. It can do it for me. I don't have to implement it. But it's going to bite you in the ass later on because it doesn't, it doesn't work correctly. It doesn't always work the way we want in, in databases. All right, so let's look at those two examples, the Bloom filters and the, uh, the tombstone tuples. So say again, whatever method we're using to figure out this is the access pattern, the access frequency of all our individual tuples. And then we can identify that these three tuples here are the, 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 the coldest ones. So we'll write those out the disk, right? So now, our indexes still point to these empty tuple slots, right? And this would be bad if we do a lookup and say, all right, well, I land here and, and it's garbage or some, it's, you know, it's some other tuple because I reclaimed the space and used it for somebody else. So instead, what we'll do is we'll make these tombstone tuples here. And now the indexes point to these guys. And this block ID and offset just tells you where to go, you know, where on disk it, it, it actually is, right? So I'm sharing this sort of in, in continuously in memory with the regular tuples, but in actuality, this would be stored as a sort of separate table heap. So that means that if, if I'm doing an index scan, that's fine, because I'll just follow my pointers and I land there. There's no, no big deal. If I'm doing a sequential scan, I need to be careful to make sure that I do my sequential scan on, on this part here, on the main table heap, but then I also need to do a sequential scan, if necessary, on the, on the, you know, the, the tombstone tuples. And of course, th there's, no, there's no values about what's in, the, uh, in these tuples in these tombstones. Right? Everything's out on disk. So if you're sequentially scanned here, you're basically reading everything because you don't know what exists out there. So now one thing you could also do, we never actually implemented this in our system, um, but instead of having to, every time you follow the index, always have to go get the, the data you need. If you, if, you're, if you can do a covering index query, meaning all the data I need to compute my query can be found in my indexes, then it doesn't matter that it's been evicted or you have these tombstones, you can, you can answer your query result from this. Right? We never actually implemented that. And the, the, another question would be, like, if I have, say, three columns and I have an index on each column, and my query does a lookup on one of those columns, can I then figure out that this is the, this is the tuple that I'm pointing to, and then do like, a reverse lookup on the other two indexes to, to, get, to, to recreate the rest of the, the tuple? Um, we never actually implemented that either, but that would, be, would, that would have been interesting. All right, the other approach is, again, with the balloon filter, and again, for every single index out that we have on our table, we're going to have a separate Bloom filter for it, right? And then the, 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 the bits in the Bloom filter are set for each key that, that we've evicted out, right? 
And then out on the cold data storage as well, we have to have another index to now tell you what the block ID and offset is for, for the tuple that you're looking for, right? Because this just tells you whether it exists or not. You gotta do a lookup on this to figure out what page has the thing I'm looking for, right? Because otherwise you have to do a sequential scan on every single page and, and that would be terrible. So if I wanna do a lookup now, right, does, does my key X exist? I always go to the in-memory index first. If I find it, then that's pointing to something that's in-memory and I'm done. If it doesn't have it, then I always gotta go check the Bloom filter and the Bloom filter will tell me whether I have it or not. If, if I don't, then I'm done. I know the key doesn't exist. If the Bloom filter says that I do have it, then I go to my index, fetch that into memory, and then figure out where, where the tuple I actually need, need is located. All right, is this clear? Yes? This question is, you cannot delete keys from the Bloom filter. Correct, yes. I mean, the Bloom filter I showed you, you cannot. There are like, uh, you can extend Bloom filters. There's like, not, not really counting Bloom filter. There's ways to keep track of, like instead of every bit just being one or zero, just keep track of the number of keys that have set it. And that way when I do a delete, but even then, it's like it's, you're not gonna get, you still could have false positives. Most people don't do, do, do that thing. They, they just rebuild it. If you want to delete something, you just rebuild this thing. Okay, so you cannot use the room filter as an indicator that whether a key is present in, in memory because sometimes we want to fix the key to the, to the disk, right? So his, stand, he, his question is, that means I can't use a bloom filter as a, uh, in front of this thing to keep track, to, to tell me whether it's something exists or not before I actually go through the index. Uh, you could do that. You'd have to um, you'd have to throw it away. No, no. So, so, so this thing doesn't need to be super accurate, right? Let's think about this. So you could delete a key. Yeah, as long as, as long as you don't have false negatives, that's fine. If you have false positives, meaning I delete a key from my index, but I haven't deleted it from my Bloom filter. So I do the lookup on the Bloom filter first. It tells me it's there. Then I do my lookup here and it's not there, right? Ignoring the storage thing, just say this is all in memory, then that would work. But for this thing here, we need, to, we, you know, we need to make sure that it doesn't exist in here and doesn't exist in here, we know it doesn't exist over there, so we don't want to go to disk. Okay. I'm sort of complicating the example, but, yeah. right? No false negatives, but sometimes false positives. And in, I, f I forget what the mathematical guarantees you need for how big of a bitmap and how many hash functions, but the target rate for the, 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 the false positive rate is like 1%. So it's not like every other one is getting, giving back bogus data. 1% is not bad. That's a fair trade off. Okay. Okay. So again, right, so now we know how to, what metadata we need to record in memory. Uh, so let's figure out now what happens when we go need to fetch the data and bring it back into memory. What do we do? So the, since we're storing everything as four kilobyte pages on disk, uh, it's very likely, it's, 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 more, it's very likely that the size of one tuple is less than a page, and therefore within one page there'll be multiple tuples, right? So that means for, for a single disk I.O. to go fetch the, the page, we're going to get back a bunch of extra stuff, which we actually don't need. So the question is, what do we do with the other ones? So we could... Uh, we could take all the tuples that we have in the block and just bring them back into memory and merge them back into the, the table, uh, even if the other ones aren't needed. But of course, that means now we have to update our indexes for every single tuple, right? Because now, you know, because now it exists in memory, it's no longer on disk. So we have, if we have a lot of tuples on our block and we have a lot of indexes, then that could be expensive when we really only needed to do it for one tuple. The other crappy thing about this is that the the one tuple I needed, that now becomes hot. But all the other tuples on my page, they're still cold. And therefore, they're, in the next round I do an eviction, they're probably going to get written out back again. So it's sort of like this, this ping-ponging back and forth of like reading data in, writing it out, reading data in, writing it out. And that's going to have write amplification. That's going to increase the number of, of IOs I'm doing down on my devices. And if, if it's an SSD, I'll wear it down more quickly. The other approach is to only merge the tuple that we needed. Uh, this is, again, this is, is computationally faster because I don't have to update all my indexes. 
The downside is going to be is that now I have a page out on disk that's going to have the copy of the tuple I just merged back in, but it's, it's not considered the correct copy. Because I could have fetched the tuple I needed back in memory, and then like an hour later it becomes cold and then I evict it back out. So now on, on, on disk I'm going to have two pages, two evicted blocks that's going to have my tuple. And I have to do extra bookkeeping to recognize that it's the last one that I, that I the most recent one that I, I evicted is the, is the correct one. So if I ever, ever have to reconstruct the database, maybe reading those old blocks, uh, that are my victim blocks, I need to make sure I skip the, the old one and only take the newer one. Right, again, and this also, because I have essentially holes in my pages. So, okay, whether we want to merge uh, all the tuples or one tuple, now the question is, what kind of merge do we want to do? So the, the easiest approach is to take all the tuples we're bringing, we're bringing back in, all the tuples we, we, we want to bring back into memory, and we just merge them into the full table heap. Again, that means updating all the indexes, so now they're, 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 we point to the, the correct ones. An alternative is that we only end up merging the tuples that, get, that are, are part of an update query. Like if I select it, I'll just read it and then throw it away right away. Same thing, well, you know, when insert doesn't make sense, but delete, same thing, who cares? So, and so for the select queries, instead of merging them into the full table, updating indexes, I'll put into a temporary buffer in memory for my one query. My, so my query that needed this tuple is the only one that can see this buffer. And then the only one can read from it. So they do whatever read they need to do, and then we throw away the buffer. So as, as if that we didn't fetch in the tuple at all. Right? The third alternative is that we can do a combination of, of um, of these two, it's deciding whether we're going to do always merge or just merge on update, but we can keep track of how often this block is being fetched. And then when we reach some threshold, we can say, all right, well, if we think this block is hot, we may or may not know what, in, what individual tuple in the block is hot, but we keep fetching it. So rather than putting it into a temporary buffer and throwing it away, let's just merge it in right now. All right, so, so this is like, I don't do it the first time I see it, I'll do it at some, some later point. All right? All right, the last design decision is that what do we do with the query that accessed the, the, the tuple that was, that was not in memory? So the first approach is that we recognize the thing we need is not in memory, we immediately abort our query or abort the transaction, Put it to, uh, you know, if it's a store procedure, we can queue it up on the side and, and, and wait for our data to finish. Otherwise, we send back an exception to the client over GDBC or ODBC, and we tell it that, you know, you have to restart your transaction, we can't run it. Then in the background, uh, in a separate thread, we go get the data they wanted, fetch it from disk, merge it in based on our merging policy, and then we, we know it's okay to then restart that query, right? Whether it's, whether it's a store procedure or, or somehow we, we could notify the, the, the client, but nobody actually does that. So the idea for this one is rather than stalling the thread when it tries to access data that's not, not on disk, which is what a traditional disk-oriented database would do, we just punt. We say, we can't do this. Go away. Come back later, and we'll have, we'll have what you want. So the problem is this doesn't work if you have queries that want to access an entire table that doesn't fit into memory. So let's say we have, we have one table. We have a, a single select query that wants to scan the entire table, but only half of it can fit in memory. So let's say the first half is in memory, the second half is on disk. I start scanning, I, I can get through the first half, and then I reach the first tuple that's not in memory, I, uh, I, get, I get aborted, I, I, I get put, put aside, then the system goes and evicts the first half of the table and brings in the second half. I restart my query and it starts off in the in memory in the second half and keeps scanning and then tries to get to the first half and then we're back where we started before, where we get aborted. So this approach won't, won't work. Um, the way to get around this is that if you relax consistency, you just let the, you know, you let the, the, the table just read whatever, whatever version that existed. Um, actually for multi-verging, this, this wouldn't be an issue. Um, as long as you, as long as you record that this guy is waiting, you know what his timestamp was, and then when you restart it, you, you let it have the old timestamp. And so they can always read the older version. But if you're doing, uh, uh, you know, update in place, um, then, then this won't work. All right, again, the, the, the second approach is that you just query comes along, tries to touch data that doesn't exist, whether you recognize that through the Bloom filter 
or the, the tombstone tuple, you just stall it. Go fetch it, the data that it needs, and then when it's, when it's ready, you go ahead and resume it. So this one can be tricky if that, you know, if, if I need a bunch of cold tuples in my, in my query, I don't want to stop maybe immediately as soon as I hit the first cold tuple. Maybe I want to keep going as far as I can, collect all the cold data that I need, and then when it actually tries to do something with that data, like send it to the client or update it, then I go stall it, fetch the data needs, and brings it all in memory. Because right? otherwise you'll, 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 you'll scan, stall, scan, stall, and, and it'll be horrible performance. All right, so let's talk about some implementations now. So we're gonna talk about uh, six, different, <laughs> six different things. So I will say the first four here, HDR, Hecaton, EPL, EPFL's version of, of Volt2B and Apache Geode, these are all tuple-based. So these are all can use the taxonomy we just talked about. Uh, and now that we have a, co a common language to describe how these systems are actually implemented, we can talk about how these guys do it. And again, they're going to be focused on tuples. And then the other two systems, LeanStore and MemSQL, these are not going to be tuple-based. In the case of LeanStore, it'll be block-based or page-based. And then for MemSQL, it's table-based. Right? MemSQL is not really, they're just punting to, to MMAP for what they're doing. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, whereas in the lean store, it's, it's, it's all implemented in software inside the data, database system itself. Okay? So let's go through each of these. So, again, HDR was a system, a system I helped work on when, uh, when I was in graduate school, and then the com it got commercialized as VoltDB uh, a few years ago, um, or at 2008 now. Um, so, we wrote a paper called Anti Caching. Right? The idea, again, was this was the, the, the reverse of a regular disk cache for. for Disk coordinate databases, right? The, the all data, data starts in memory, and then we find the cold ones and shove it out the disk, right? So that's why it's called the anti, anti cache. So it's sort of a clever name that Stonebreaker came up with. Um, I always like to say when we wrote the paper the first time, we had anti caching in the title. The reviewers hated that title, so we took it out. Then the paper got accepted, and then Stonebreaker was like, yeah, put that back in, right? <laughs> so we did that. I think it's a good name. All right, so ASHR is going to do online identification. We would actually track. Or you would sample and track how transactions were accessing every single tuple. We had the administrator to find the threshold to say if you get 80% to your max capacity of memory, then that kicks the kicks in the eviction process, and you keep evicting until you hit some low water mark. So I, I would say if I'm at 80% capacity, I start evicting until I'm down to 60% capacity. We're going to use tombstone tuples again that was stored in, in a separate table heap. Uh, we would do abort and restart retrieval. And this is because we were doing store procedures. With, so we would stall the or abort the store procedure, roll back all its changes, put it into a side queue, fetch the data that it needs, and then have a callback mechanism to say, the data I want is now there. Let me go restart this transaction. And then we were doing block level granular of the data we were storing. And then in the original implementation, we would always merge every, all the data, all the tuples into a single block. In the subsequent paper that I showed before from 2016, that's the one where we, we explore different options to do more selective merging. The other most famous, famous system that was doing uh, larger than memory databases uh, was this thing called Project Siberia out of Microsoft for the Hecaton project. To the best of my knowledge, and I think the Lean Store paper talks about this, is this never actually made it in production. This never actually made it into the real version, the, the commercial version of Hecaton. Um, it was probably due, due to the complexity of it. So they were doing offline identification. So again, they would maintain a log that re recorded how transactions were accessing tuples. And then they had a background that had to come and compute histograms ba based on the log. Same thing, they had administrator defined threshold. They were using bloom filters to figure out, to approximate whether the tuple would exist out on disk. Um, they were doing synchronous retrieval. So they would block threads or block the query, go fetch the data they needed and bring it back in. And they were doing this because they weren't uh, they weren't a store procedure based system the way that HStore and VoltDB are. They were doing tuple land of granularity of, of the data they, they needed, and then because of that, they would always merge. Because I would always grab a single tuple and merge that in. And like I said, there's a bunch of papers from these guys that sort of discuss a bunch of these issues, uh, but it, it never made it in, into production. All right, so let's talk about a system that actually uses MMAP in an interesting way. So. This is a this is a uh, it was a research uh, extension to VoltDB 
by Natasha Alamaki's group at EPFL in Switzerland. Natasha Alamaki was the database professor here at CMU before she left for Switzerland. Like before I showed up, she was basically me here. Um, or I'm, I'm her now, right? Uh, so again, so this, they, this is not, this never actually was put into production for VoltDB. They just took VoltDB because it's open source. They modified it to do, to do this, this technique. So they were going to do offline identification. Again, have a log, figure out what's cold, what's hot. But they would actually use the OS virtual memory in a very clever way. I'll show in the next slide. Um, and because it was OS virtual memory, that means that these things are always fixed. They're always going to have synchronous retrieval because when you try to go fetch something that's not in memory, uh, the OS will, will hit a page fault, stall your thread, go fetch it while you, while you, while you wait. And then and the virtual memory is always based on pages, and they're always merging everything. Because the OS doesn't know about what's actually in your page. It doesn't know that there's tuples. It just knows that it's a page that it needs and brings it in. So let's look to see how this worked. So what they would do is they would have this, this single in-memory table heap backed by MMAP. But they would, uh, they would designate different regions of memory to be either hot or cold. And then for the hot tuples, they would use MNVise to tell the OS, pin this region here. Never evict these pages. These, oh, they always have to stay in memory. Whereas the cold tuple region, the OS was allowed to swap these, this out as needed. So they would use the, uh, an offline identification, figure out this tuple is cold then from the hot region. But then rather than, again, them putting it to a page and running out the disk, they would just move it down here into the cold region. And you can think of this as a delete followed by an insert. So then I can now reuse that space for whatever other new tuple I want to put in there. So now down here, again, this, this region here is not pinned. We didn't, tell the OS, we didn't tell the OS to keep it in memory. So at some later point, the OS may decide, oh, I, I have memory pressure. Let me go fetch some, you know, take some page here and write it out the disk. Right? So one thing you need to be very careful about here is that in the same way we, we have to worry about uh, in data alignment and, and, and word boundaries when we talked about how to lay out things in memory, we need to be very careful to make sure that we lay out our tuples according to the page boundaries of the OS's virtual memory as well. Right? Yes? Was the amount of hot tuples fixed or did it grow? So his question is, 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 is this region fixed? Yes, this region is fixed. Yes. Um, Typically for in-memory databases, the way it works is when you turn them on, you tell the system, like, you have 10 gigs, right? And, and that's fixed. So how it divides it up. So, it, so I don't know whether they were doing something sophisticated to figure out, oh, our working set size is really this big. It's, it was probably just fixed. All right, so the thing we got to be careful about is that just like we got to worry about word alignment in, for data in memory, we got to worry about page alignment for, for the data down here. Because what we don't want to happen is we don't want to have our tuple now span two pages and then this thing gets evicted and written out, right? Because the, OS, the, we, the, the, the hardware is not going to be able to guarantee that this is actually atomic. It can, can only write one page at a time, right? And we also don't want the case of like when we do a fetch, we don't want to do two IOs to get this one tuple, right? We, we want to do one IO. So I, again, I think this is, this is um, I don't know what, what I don't, I don't know what happened if you actually updated the tuple. Do they actually put it back in, in, the, in the hot hot space? I think they would have to because again, if you don't want to modify anything down here because the OS is free to swap that out at any time, and there's a bunch of extra stuff you have to do, be able to be super careful with with uh, fences and whatnot to make sure that it doesn't write out data to disk before you write out the log record that corresponds to the change. Um, but I, I so that essentially makes this region read only. So what I will say is that for OHP workloads, if you're doing updates, I think MMAP is a bad idea. Again, we want to prove that this semester. For read-only data, I think it might be OK. I think it's OK. Um, there's a bunch of extra stuff you, you, you may want to do, like prefetching and, uh, and I don't want to say too much. There's a bunch of other things I think you have to do to make MMAP work, but you have to do that anyway if you're managing memory yourself. But if it's read-only, I think it's OK. OK, the, uh, the last tuple-based system I want to talk about is called Apache Geode. Apache Geode was originally called, I'm going to get this wrong, I think it was either Gemfire or SQL Fire, I forget. But basically, there was some startup that built an in-memory database. Then they got bought by VMware. 
And then VMware says, we, uh, then VM VMware merged their database division with EMC's database division, because they had Greenplum, and that became Pivotal. And then Pivotal basically said, we don't want to be in the database business anymore. And then they sort of offloaded some of their, their systems. Right? They still do Greenplum. Uh, but I think uh, you know, Geode was like Gemfire, and they, then they sent it to Apache and renamed it. Um, I have actually ne never met anybody that actually uses this. This is true. Yes, correct. I, I'm sure people do. I, 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 just, I, I haven't come across them. Oh, that's not true. I, it's somebody in Russia. Sorry. OK. All right, so what they're going to do, they're going to do online identification, ministry under defined threshold. I think they use tombstones. It's not clear in the documentation. Um, but basically what happened is that they would write things out to HDFS. So Geode is a distributed in-memory database, and you have this sort of shared disk layer with HDFS, and that's what they would use to, to, to write data out. And then they would bring single tuples back in. I don't again, How they would actually do this in HDFS, I don't know. Um, but then they would only merge the tuple on update. And the reason is because since, since HDFS is a pen only, there's actual work you'd have to do if you want to invalidate some, some page and say this is not the, the, the primary location of this, this tuple anymore. It's now in memory. So if you only do an update, then that reduces the amount of work you have to do for this. OK. So as I said, these four approaches, HDOR, VoltDB from EPFL, uh, uh, Project Siberia from Hackathon, and Apache Geode, these are all tuple-based. So the two issues, the key issues or the limitations about these approaches is that we have to track the metadata about how tuple transactions or queries are accessing tuples on a per-tuple basis. And this actually can be quite expensive. So in the case of HDOR and anti-caching, we would have to maintain a pointer inside the header to keep track of where the, the tuple was in the LRU, LRU chain to figure out what was the coldest, what was the hottest. So that's adding now an extra 64 bits for every single tuple. Now, it wasn't actually that bad in both V and HDR because it's not multi-version, so it's not like I have all those additional timestamps. So the 64-bit pointer wasn't a big overhead, but still, it, it, it adds up. The other thing to point out, too, is that there's nothing I said this entire lecture that talked about indexes. It was all about tuples. But last class, when we talked about compression at the very end, I showed you that table that said, for some workloads, the index is comprised about, or about oh, up to almost 60% of the total amount of space or memory being used by a database, an in-memory database. So that means that we're targeting these, these tuples to, to write them out the disk, but that's not where we, where we should be looking. It's actually trying to figure out how, how, how do we, can we evict the, the indexes. So Hackathon sort of could do a little bit of this because they would remove it from the index and just put it in the Bloom filter, and the Bloom filter is much smaller than the index. But none of the other guys uh, were handling this. So what we want now is we want a, 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 a unified approach to, to managing memory that we want to show about the disk that can handle the two main contributing factors to the size of our database in memory, both tables and indexes. Meaning we don't want to have separate policies for indexes, separate policies for, for, for tables. We want everything to be all the same. So this is the problem that Lean Store is trying to solve. So Lean Store is a, is a early prototype of a storage manager out of Munich from the same guys that, that wrote Hyper. They wrote Lean Store, but to the best of my knowledge, this Lean Store is not part of the Hyper project or the new Son of Hyper system that they're building now called Umbra. Right? So it's sort of, sort of it's a separate thing. Again, the key thing about what Lean Store can do is that it can evict cold data that are both in tuples and in indexes. Right? So that, that's much different than what, everything else. So the core idea of what they're going to do is that they're essentially going to build a buffer pool manager in the same way we have a disk-oriented system. But it's going to be entirely decentralized. And it's going to have a hierarchical model of, of, of keeping track of, of what data is in memory and what can be, what can be written to disk, what, what can stay in memory. And then rather than tracking every individual tuple or every individual page and say, Here, here's, here's when it's being accessed, they're actually going to just do random selection of pages to evict them, then track, after you've selected for eviction, then track it to see whether it gets accessed again before you evict it. If yes, then you just put it back into the hot space. If no, then you evict it, because no one touched it. So this is much different than everything else we've talked about so far. 
right? Well, in the case of the, even of the online offline approaches, you were still tracking every single uh, tuple that the transactions were accessing, then using that to figure out what was hot and cold. But if something's hot, you just, you just assume that it's hot and don't track anything, right? Because that's, 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 that's the, the data that everyone's going to touch, and you don't want to be on the critical path of query execution to slow down the system while you go update metadata. It's only when you go say, I think I want to evict this, then you turn on the track and you figure out whether it actually gets touched. So the core idea that they're going to use to make this all work is a technique called pointer swizzling, which I don't think we discussed in the introduction class. Um, so I'll describe what that is. So they're going to use pointers to figure out that you have to store to keep track of this thing points to this page. They're going to use that to figure out whether something's in memory or not, rather than having this, this separate page directory or page table you have in a disoriented system. All right, so the idea of pointer swizzling is basically to say that uh, you can have a, an object has a pointer to some other object in our database. Um, it does not necessarily have to be a, a, you know, a database object. It could be like an internal data structure. It doesn't matter. And you would have one type of pointer for when something is on disk and another type of pointer when something's in memory. And so you just have a little identifier. In this case here, they're using a single bit uh, of the in entire 64-bit pointer to indicate that this is an in-memory uh, location or this is a uh, block ID and offset to, if, because it's on disk. So actually, just a general question. I have 64 pointers on, on x86 Xeons. How many bits are we actually using in that 64 bits for addresses? Raise your hand if you think all 64 bits. Well, I kind of spoiled it, right? It's not, all right? Yes? 48 bits, yes. So the current Xeon hardware is, everything is, is addressed to 64-bit pointers, but the, the hardware itself only uses 48 bits of those. So you can only have, I think, what is that? 35 terabytes of memory, right? So people do this trick all the time where they say, hey, I got 64 bits, but I'm, I don't need to use 16 of it. So let me go put a bunch of crap in the part that the hardware is never actually going to read. And I can use that in my system to figure out what, what, what it is I'm actually looking at. Now, when we talked about Judy arrays, they had those Judy pointers. They were just taking two 64-bit words, and they had the full pointer on one side and then extra metadata on the other side. I, in that case, I don't think they had enough space to store all the extra stuff they wanted to store in the remaining bits after the, the 48 bits. In this case here, we only need one bit, so that's fine. Now, I will say is that I was at a uh, sort of workshop uh, for, with SAP HANA guys a few years ago. They had a speaker come from Intel, and, and they were talking about they had this, they had this HANA installation that it was, a, it was a beast of a machine. They maxed out the all 48 bits of memory uh, and, and, you know, on, on a single database instance, like it was you know, some $2 million machine. Um, and the Intel guy basically said it's coming down in the future where, where the, 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 the pointers will be true 64-bit pointers. So don't store extra crap in here, right? So we've avoided doing this in our, in our own system. Now, he told, he told us that this was coming two years ago and it still hasn't happened yet. So I don't know when it's happening. But, so that's what they're doing. They're, so that's why we can use this extra bit and not worry about us pointing to garbage because no one's actually going to use this. All right, so... We're going to use this first bit to tell us whether it's on disk or in memory. So if the bit is zero, then we know that what, we should be, what we're looking at is a page ID and offset. But let's say we, touch the, we, we bring this data in, and now our pointer points to this. That bit's set to one, so we know we should interpret that as a true memory address. right? So the, again, the idea here is that <coughs> this thing has one pointer, but depending on where we move this block that it's pointing to, we update that pointer with, with the correct information. And this is only going to work for us if there is one and only one pointer to any object uh, at a time. And that's going to allow us to do our updates latch free. Because if some other block is pointing to this thing too, then I need to set latches somewhere to say, all right, now the pointer is this. Because otherwise you have race conditions. And that's essentially what the page table is doing in a discordian system. Right? It's an indirection layer. Uh, or think of the mapping table in the BW tree. It's an indirection layer to, where we have a single location where we can say, if the data you, here's, here's, to find out what, here's to find the address for the data you need. And it's one compare and swap to go update that. So the way they're going to organize memory is through this hierarchy where you only have one pointer, and that allows you to do this without having a mapping table. So the next interesting thing about Lean Store, which I really liked, is that 
rather than trying to be clever of deciding you know, what's least, in, le least recently used or whatever, they're just going to random roll the dice, randomly pick some pages and say, you're going to be evicted. Right? And then they put it into this, uh, this sort of cooling stage where they say, we think we're going to evict this thing, see whether it actually gets access before I, uh, before I evict it. If yes, I'll, I'll make it hot again and put it back, you know, keep it in memory. If not, then I know nobody needed it, and it's safe for me to go write it out. So, the, again, the advantage of this over all the approaches we talked about before is that we don't need to record any metadata about tuples or how tuples are being, are being accessed, or in this case, pages are being accessed, if they're hot, which is the most common case, the thing we want to optimize for, right? The whole reason the data is considered cold is that nobody's accessing it. So it's okay if we have to do extra work to keep track that we accessed it when it's cold because we're not going to do it that often. So what will happen is when we identify something for eviction, then we're going to unswizzle their pointer uh, but still leave it in memory. But then we're going to put the, the, the information about that page in a separate hash table that we can then go consult to see whether something is really on disk or whether it, it actually is, is, is in memory in this cooling stage. And then if we access it again, we remove it from this queue and then just swizzle the pointer again. Right? Otherwise, if, if we, our page it doesn't get access and we reach the front of the queue, if someone needs to reclaim space, we get evicted. All right, so let's talk about how the, we're going to organize pages. And I'll show a demo or show the, what, what, the illustration of what this looks like in the next slide. So unlike in a disk-based system uh, where the buffer pool, the, 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 the page, the, the, you know, the heap is just this list of pages. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to actually organize our blocks into, the, into a hierarchy. So you're going to have parent, and parent can have children. All right, one, you have one parent can have multiple children, but every, every child can only have one parent. And so because of this, we have this hierarchy. This will guarantee that every single block, every single page, only has one pointer to it. It's parent. So this avoids that problem of two guys pointing to the same thing. Now, for indexes, this is totally easy to understand. Like, think of a B, B plus tree. It's already tree structure. There's already, you know, pointer to, to one, one guy. How you handle siblings is another story. But uh, in that case, the memory can already be laid out in a hierarchy. So that works nicely with this. For uh, the, reg the regular buffer pool, you, you basically have upper pages that you basically have to almost treat it as like a, like viewing, uh, uh, like a breath first search if you, if you want to scan along something. Right? You just say, th th this, this page starts, and here's some more pages that come after it. Right? It's an unordered heap, so it doesn't matter where they exist in the hierarchy. But we just know that we point to, point to children. So now what will happen is, because we have this tr tree structure for our buffer pool, we, we flip a coin or roll the dice, we, we pick a random page for eviction. If we end up picking a page that has, ch has children that have not been evicted, then we cannot evict that parent page. Because what we don't want to happen is we can't have our parent page get written out the disk with its swizzled pointer to its children because when it, comes, when it gets put back into to memory, that pointer is going to be invalid because it's going to point to some memory location that may not even exist anymore or may not point to a new page. So to avoid that problem, if I try to pick a parent node or parent child to get evicted and it has unswizzled, uh, sorry, has swizzled children, then I'm going to pick one of its children to get evicted. And that's still considered random enough, and that's fine. All right? So let's look at an example here. So the hierarchy of storage now is going to be in three stages. So they'll have a cold, a cooling, and a hot stage. And so for this, we're going to distinguish between pointers between swizzled and unswizzled. So again, a unswizzled pointer has, has the bit flag set to zero, and it's a page ID offset. So this is out on disk. It tells me where to go find this block on disk. If it's swizzled, then it's an in-memory address. right? So let's say that uh, we decide we, we, we roll, roll the dice, we decide we want to evict B1 here. So in the, all the other examples I showed before, when we say we want to evict this, we would immediately write it out as a disk. So, but we're not going to do that here. Instead, we're going to migrate it down into the cooling stage. Uh, we're going to add it to our hash table inside the cooling, for the cooling stage, where we're going to have a map to the, now, where it should be on disk, Right? The, the page ID and offset, that'll then get mapped to a, its location into an eviction queue. And then the eviction queue has 
the, the, the physical memory address of where this page is located. So now uh, for my, my parent page here, it's going to have an unswizzle pointer, which is going to be, the, again, the page ID and offset. So if I'm now doing a scan or I'm doing traversal into this hierarchy, and I want to do a lookup on B1, all I have is the unswizzled address. So I do a lookup first into this thing. If it's, if it's not there, then I know it's on disk, and I go to disk and get it. If it is there, then I would follow this hash table, find it to the eviction queue, pull it out of the eviction queue, and now move it back into the hot stage and update pointers. So again, I really like this idea because it, it, it's completely decentralized. There's no single page table to keep track of what's in memory versus not in memory, right? The information about it is, is essentially retained inside the pointers themselves, but that's always in a single location. And so to do, we can do simple compare and swaps to, to, to flip that around. Um, and then here, if, if we ever need to get a free, uh, free memory, you know, we, we need to get a free block, a free page to store something new, we just go grab whatever's in the, the front of the queue, uh, write it out the disk, and now reclaim its space, and then remove it from the hash table. Right? There's one latch I think you have to handle for uh, making sure there's not a race condition of, of when you try to fetch, if you're trying to fetch something out, fetch something in and write something out. Uh, but the, that's, you know, that's not in the common case, right? The most of the common case you're going to act accessing hot data. So again, I, I really like this paper. I really like this idea. Uh, and when he, you know, when, when Victor sort of explained to us, it sort of like, it clicked in my head. I'm like, yeah, that's it. That was, that, that's a good idea. So any questions about this? No one's as, as enthusiastic about this paper as I am? OK. Yeah. All right. All right. The last technique, the last system I'm going to talk about is MemSiegel. So MemSiegel is not really doing the sort of automatic eviction stuff that we talked about here. Uh, they have the ability to, uh, to, to have tables that are backed by MMAP, and they just let the OS swap things out. So MemSiegel is a HTAP system. So they have a row store and a column store. The row store always exists in memory, and it's managed. You know, it's it's, it's they malloc their own heaps and manage that. And that never gets evicted. But then you can declare a table as a column store table, and then that gets backed by MMAP. And now the OS is allowed to swap anything out that it, that it needs. Of course, now you still want to be able to update update the the column store. So they have that delta store that we talked about when we, we were talking about the, the the split execution engines. They have a little delta store that they can use to absorb updates, and then and then background process will go ahead and merge those in carefully uh, and try to avoid issues with, with with the OS. So in this case here, if you have if you have data in the row store and you want to evict some of it, the only thing you can do is is dump the table out and load it back in as a column store table. But from the application standpoint, it's going to appear as two separate tables because it's not going to know the column store table is linked to the row store. At least the last time I read their docs, that was the case. All right? So there's no evict eviction metadata because the OS handles this. They're doing synchronous retrieval because the OS will, will block your thread when you try to access data that's not in memory when it go fetches it. And then the OS doesn't know what's in a page, so they always merge everything. OK? All right, so to finish up. Um, the, again, today was really all about how can we identify that we have cold data and, and maybe re reduce the amount of memory pressure in our system by writing it out to some auxiliary storage. But then we had to do a bunch, bunch of extra stuff to make sure that if some query comes along and wants the data you know, that does that on disk, we have a mechanism to find it, retrieve it, and bring it back in. So again, from the application standpoint, it doesn't know that anything's in memory or on disk, and that's the beauty of the relational model because we hide all that from you at the logical layer. Uh, but we need to make this all work very efficiently. Um, and none of the, the techniques, except for the, uh, the lean store, would actually handle indexes, which was a major, a major contribution to that over overhead. Now, we're not going to talk about non-volatile memory this semester. Um, well, so what I will say is non-volatile memory is actually a new storage device that Intel's putting out this year. Now, every time I give this lecture, I always say it's always this year. Uh, I just, I just do a montage because it's like been three years in a row. And you're like, yeah, it's coming out this year. It's coming out this year, right? All right. It is actually coming out this year. We actually have access to it. In we don't have physical access to it. But we, there's a machine in at Intel's labs in Oregon. We can log into and use it. Um, my first PhD student, Joy, uh, who was the sort of the, the, the initial creator with me on Peloton, who's now at Georgia Tech. His whole dissertation was on non-volatile memory databases. So 
The way to think about non-volatile memory database or non-volatile memory is it looks like DRAM. It's byte addressable. It's fast, but it's persistent like an SSD. So you pull the plug and it retains all the data. So that it starts to get kind of really interesting because, in my opinion, all the crap we talked about today goes away. Because who cares? Because it's going to look like a single address space. Some of it's going to be in DRAM, some of it's going to be in MVM. And it's actually, you can run the MVM in different modes, where like it's, whether it's transparent to you or not. Um, but all the extra crap we have to do, we just let the hardware handle that. And that's, and that's amazing. So I think what we're talking about today will, will go away when MVM becomes more prevalent. But we're not there yet. So, all right. Any questions about the larger than memory databases? So normally I teach this one at the end of the semester. Uh, Forget my reasoning why I wanted to bring this up closer. Um, I, I, I think this is something interesting, um, and, and it's, I want you guys to focus on it now, because by the end of the semester, everyone, everyone gets burned out, and no one reads the paper, papers more carefully. So <laughs> it's, that was sort of my, I think that was the one reason why I moved it forward. Um, so next class, next, next Monday, will be about logging and checkpoints. So, for this one, we're going to bring, you know, we need the disk again because we have to make sure that all our changes are durable. If we lose power, DRAM gets wiped. So we want to talk about how can we efficiently write things in and out to disk um, and then recover from that if we have a crash. And then if we have a little time, uh, maybe I'll also talk about doing uh, log replication over, over the network to another machine. Okay? All right, guys. Uh, enjoy your weekend. See ya. You got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I'll guzzle cause I'm more man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is wet. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. They go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the chili cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of St. Isles.